labs where we build this tool called Bitler. It's a smart contract development task runner. And we recently launched Bitler EVM. And it's a test development network. A, I mean, a development network uh, with, which has this very interesting feature that whenever your transactions or calls fail, it generates a solid stack trace. And this presentation is going to be about how we do that. But going back to the beginning, uh, let's talk a little bit about how Solidity debugging has evolved. For me, this started on 2017. I was a Bitcoin maximalist or recovery maximalist back then. And one of my friends, Manu, convinced me to join them to build their first DAP. And I knew nothing about Ethereum, but I began reading about it, got super excited again about crypto, and started building this stuff. And I wasn't in charge of the smart contacts, so I, had, I knew nothing about Solidity, just doing some front-end stuff. And the day, the day came where I finally had the smart contacts to integrate them. And the first thing I tried to do was the most basic thing, just send it to the contract from my UI. And I was super happy about that, but all I got was invalid code. <laughs> and what the fuck was going on? <laughs> invalid code. I was sure that I was using the right compiler. How can I have an invalid code? I wasn't doing anything with opcodes. I wasn't modifying the contract. Just compile, execute, invalid opco, no sense. So I must have spent at least one day trying to figure out what was going on until my friend Manu again came and told me, oh, invalid opco, there's a new keyword now, it's payable. If you don't have payable to your smart contract, you can't send it to it. And it was like, man, I checked every single line of the documentation, every tutorial, everything. And he was like, mm, okay, man, it's the lineage, it's the lineage of technology. <laughs> That's why they call it like that. But it will eventually get better. And ever since then, this is how I felt whenever I can get solidity. I mean, with time I develop my own techniques for the brain, like <laughs> this one, just adding console log between every single line of JavaScript and I don't know, at least like that I could figure out which transaction was failing. Or this one, just commenting random chunks of solidity and rerun everything until I eventually figure out what, what was going on. But I keep thinking about what Manu told me that it will eventually get better and it got a, it got a little better. We got reverse reasons that are super useful, but I don't know, we weren't comfortable enough with the speed of improvement, so we started working on Builder, our development tool. And last week, we, la we launched what we call integrated JavaScript and Solidity exceptions. These are just native JavaScript ex exceptions that combine both your JavaScript uh, stack, stack trace up until the moment that you call it into your contract and on top of that you get the entire Solidity stack trace. So in a single trace you get the entire picture of why your test is failing. You get like up until which point in your test it failed and then you get where in your contract it failed. And also it recognizes a bunch of common errors in Solidity, like calling a function that, that, that doesn't exist, and it gives you a precise error message on those cases. Instead of just reverting without reason, it, stay, it takes you, you are trying to call a function that doesn't exist. So, how did we do that? Before going into that, Let's talk a little bit about how stack traces work on a normal environment. So, let's say that you are running a C++ program, it's just a binary. Whenever you have a data structure that everyone knows, the stack, or called stack, just stack, uh, 
and whenever you call into a function, a new stack frame is created that is just its local variables with a bunch of metadata. And whenever you return from a function, a stack frame is popped from the stack. And if this program needs to generate a needs to program exception, it will just start the process that it's called stack and rolling. It gets popping up stack frames one by one until it gets into a narrow counter. And I know that's super easy. It's the same program that it's responsible for doing the stack frame. So sounds easy. But the thing is that in Solidity, in the ABM in general, we don't have a, a call stack. Why? I have no idea, but it's that way. There are some people proposing in, the, in EIP to have an actual call stack in the EVM. I don't know who they are and I don't know the state of that EIP, but I think it's a super valuable effort and I hope that shifts someday. And the other problem is gas. So in C++ or whichever language, you can, you can generate extra code or extra metadata just to do things like stack traces. But in, in Ethereum, you pay every single log code that you execute. So Solidity is kind of forced to generate as, as small a bytecode as possible. So things like metadata for stack trace doesn't seem to belong there. So that forces us to generate the stack trace externally. You just your only hope is to be an external server of the EVM and somehow map the EVM execution into the Solidity uh, sources. And what does this mean? That you trace, you execute your contracts, trace the EVM, trace in this case is just get a list of opcodes that were executed and then you have to do lots and lots of things to reconstruct the solidity semantics. So our first challenge was how to get from opcodes to solidity. Uh, when you compile a smart contract you get a ton of output. Between those things there are bytecodes. So Bytecodes are just a list of instructions, not much. Uh, and luckily, for each bytecode, you also have a source map. And a source map is an option that tells you a little bit about the bytecode. It just grabs an offset length of file that maps into a chunk of a file uh, that generated that opcode. And then it has this sometime thing that we'll talk about that later. But, okay, this is super useful, and without this we wouldn't have done nothing, but the problem is that it's still super low level. <coughs> we need to have a more semantic model of the thing. So, from a bytecode we want to be able to get which contract it belongs to, all of their functions, if they are payable, external, internal, their selectors, everything which source were they defined on. I mean, I don't know, I, I think this doesn't look like hard, like hard, but it was probably one of the most challenging things. Uh, because you have to, I mean, you get the output of the compiler and the solidity input, and then you have to recreate lots of logic uh, from the compiler just to mimic what it does to be sure that you are actually creating a model that maps what Solidity uses. So, I, so for example, getting a selector of a function sounds easy, but when you start to take into consideration all the different features from Solidity, I assure you that computing selectors is super hard. But, Okay, so if we have this model, the next thing is to reconstruct the call stack. And this is the easiest part. You don't have a call stack in 
in the EVM, but you have an EVM and you can create your own code stack. It's just a stack. So when you execute a smart contact, you save the list of opcodes that go executed. That's the uh, EVM trace. And you inspect by by one iterating. And whenever you find a sham, here you pay attention to that sham type thing that the source map gives you. And what's, what's in there is whether if the champ was a champ into a function, a return, or an internal champ like an if. So it's easy. If you call into a champ, if, if your champ is calling into a function, you push that function in your, into your stack. If your champ is a return, you pop a function, and that's it. I mean, some CC, there's some complications because there's a uh, things like modifiers that are in actual functions, but still we wanted to show them on our stack traces. So we have some special cases for things like that, just to, I don't know, make the lives of developers easier. Because, I don't know, if you just go into a function that is only owner, you may end up just showing only owner and not which function was called. Uh, but apart from that, Creating a code stack is pretty easy. So, next challenge, external calls. What I just said about the code stack is, in fact, a super simplification, because the EVM is a very weird machine. Whenever you have to do an external call, like just call, delegate call, or all of those, the semantics of that is that you have to create another EVM, an empty EVM, and you execute there the other contract. So, in fact, a trace of the EVM is a recursive thing. So, you get a list of opcodes that were executed up until, up until an external code, code, and then you get another trace, and then some opcodes continue. And of course, this other trace, this other smart contact, can also have an external code. So it's a it's a recursive thing by nature. So yes, creating the code stack for each of these traces individually is very easy. But then you have, then you need some logic to combine them because they are just different executions with different stack traces. And how do you combine them? Well, it depends. It depends on what gonna the smart contact do if the external code phase. So most of them, especially if you are in doing anything low level, we just forward the error and eventually revert the transaction. But you have to detect that because some calls just don't forward errors and ignore them. And in the case and if the error is forward, that means that you have to combine the stack traces like merging them somehow and keep going because maybe you are still in a, on, on an external call and you may have to merge the thing multiple, multiple times. But that's fine. I mean, we added lots of logic to detect those cases, but once it's done, we got a step closer. Another challenge, and this is also a big one, is recognizing which contracts are you running. Because up until I, and up until now, I was assuming that I knew which smart contract I was looking at. But that's not the case when you are running lots of tests with multiple smart contracts. You only have an EVM that executes chunks of bytecode, and that bytecode belongs to a smart contract, but purely figuring out which one is not that easy. For each smart contract, there are two different bytecodes generated, one for deploying it and the other one for running it on runtime. I mean, the, it's the deployed bytecode. And recognizing the deployed bytecode can be very easy, especially if you don't use libraries. Uh, it's just an exact match. You just search for it and that's it. But the problem is that when you use libraries, when you link libraries, you are actually modifying the, the bytecode. You just have to add 
an address somewhere in the bytecode. And also, when you are deploying a smart, a smart contract, you are also modifying the bytecode because you are appending its params at the end of it. So the exact, the exact match search thing doesn't work. What we did is to create a modified write uh, that lets you search for these bytecodes. Uh, it's a kind of tricky thing, uh, but in general terms, we created a canonical representation of each bytecode by zeroing out where, uh, the places where addresses are going to be placed, and then use that canonical representation to save the, the bytecode model that we talked about before. And then when you are when you are executing a bytecode in the VM and you don't know which model it belongs to, you just search it on the drive. If you got a match, you're done. That's fine. But if you don't, there are two possibilities. It might have got stuck because the next byte uh, is the beginning of the params of a constructor. And if that's the case, you can check if that node is a uh, has the constructor associated and use that. But if not, you are probably stuck because of a library that got linked and you have the normalized version of it associated to the tribe. So what we do there is to check all the descendants from that node, figure out which of them use, use libraries, and, normal, and try to normalize our bytecode as if it were uh, one of those, and rerun the search. Rerun the search. And that works. It has some issues uh, on about how to implement it, and you can't use things like normal tries uh, using recursion or things like that. But after some work, we got this working, and we were super happy because we thought that this was the last missing piece uh, to get stack traces. So we started doing some integration tests, and everything worked great for some time. Because then we started doing crazy things with our smart contracts, and we figured out that most of them fail on things that are just not mapped by Solidity. So I know I told you that for every bytecode, for, for every opcode, you get this source map object, and that's true, but some of them mean nothing. They, they are just, I don't know, they are just there to keep the indexes. Uh, sync, but they mean they just have a file minus one that that means this didn't come from Solidity. This was auto generated. So then, I mean, we could have stopped there because you kind of have a stack trace, and if if up to some point you have a stack trace, and if your users were actually using revert, require, and things like that they have the entire thing. But giving a great developer experience means going that extra mile to get that better error message or to get that info to your, to your users just to make things better. So what we did was compile lots and lots of contracts with weird error conditions and just look at their bytecode for weeks. <laughs> I mean, it's a very stressful thing to do, especially at the beginning, but then you get used to it. And you start recognizing the different error patterns that Solidity generates. And once you are pretty certain that you can recognize them by hand, you can codify that in JavaScript and just repeat the same thing and detect them. The thing is that you you may overfit a little bit too much on the part on how you recognize the patterns. So you have to create some loosely loosey heuristics. You can't uh, just look at the actual opcodes that Solidity generates because that may change from version to version. And you have to do things a little bit more 
flexible. So our heuristics are things like, okay, this smart contract failed in a knob code that's not mapped. And okay, so let's look at the latest map source code, the uh, opcode, and uh, things like that. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Each of them work like that, <laughs> like with super loosey heuristics. But that also means that they can go wrong. So what we did was create a whole lot of of unit testing uh, for, especially for this part of the thing, uh, and eventually got it working correctly. So our final challenge, how do we show this info? Because so far it's just a JavaScript data structure or a JSON and we need to show it to the user. So one of the ideas we had was just to create a mocha reporter. Reporters are just the UI that happens to be shown when your test fails. And that was a nice idea but it failed a little bit to couple to mocha. Because Bidler VM doesn't just work on Mocha, but it just run everywhere, no brands. And also, we don't want to tie Bidler to Mocha. Uh, for example, some guy from Chains came, came to say hi and told us that they are using or trying to use Bidler VM with chest. So tying it to Mocha would fail like a failure. And the other thing is that we really wanted to show these solid stack traces in the context of JavaScript because before your your transaction failed, you probably executed a whole lot of other things, mostly on JavaScript, to set up the smart contract in a particular state that make it fail. So we wanted to take that into account. And what we did was using some not so well known, but very well documented and supported V8 APIs that let you, let you create stack traces as you wish. Uh, so we get we get the stack we get a stack trace up until the point where you started executing the ABM, you started executing your contract, and combine that with the solidity stack trace. So. That's how we got this result that I showed at the beginning. This is just a JavaScript exception with a few JavaScript frames, the whole Solidity stack trace, and an automatically generated error that was recognized with one of those heuristics. So, how can you use this? You just have to install Builder. Uh, it has plugins for almost everything, so if you are using Truffle 4, Truffle 5, Waffle, you just install your plugins, create a super simple uh, configuration file, rerun your tests, and you have stack traces. So that's it. Thanks, everyone. For your so I just wanted to say thank you to the people who supported this effort. Some people at the EF and mostly to the few CGS team, Sina and Holger, who have been super helpful. And to all my friends who support me while I was crazy doing this and asking lots of questions.